Hi, I'm Dr. Kevin Brown, and we are here today with my awesome assistant, Jed, and our great patient, Mason, and he has a chipped front tooth, a class four fracture, something we see all the time in our daily general practice. And so we're here to show how Tokuyama's newest composite, Omnichroma, an Omnichroma blocker on a class four fracture. And these are challenging restorations to do, but with this one shade composite system, we're gonna hopefully show you how it can simplify the process and make it a lot easier for color matching and uh, the whole technique process. There's a couple different ways to do this, uh, and we'll talk about that, and I'll show you my favorite way of doing it. So when you have a patient come in with a chipped front tooth, they're not gonna wanna come in and, and be rescheduled for the next day, or they're not gonna want just a temporary patch and then have them back for another visit to do a more advanced type of restoration with multiple shades and colors. Um, but if, you're, if you get efficient with this material, you can do things really quick and get amazing results. So kind of the standard way that I like to do things is by either taking an impression of the patient's teeth and just pouring it up in a really fast set stone that sets up in like 10 minutes, the snap stone. And then you can just do a little wax up and you make this little silicone putty index here, which you can see. And so we've got our, our shape built up and our, sh our incisal length. So this will help guide how the restoration is gonna be in the mouth and it helps us control the thicknesses of the different layers. And that's important when we're using the Omnichroma blocker. The other way is if you don't have time to take a quick impression and pour it up in stone, then you simply use the silicone putty and you take an impression uh, with the putty of the fractured tooth. And then once that comes out, you can just use a burr with uh, a round burr of some sort, or even a, a rounded diamond tip. And then you can just drill out where that fracture was and you're just trying to get a basic shape of the tooth so you can get a shelf to work with, with the Omnichroma blocker in order to get the right uh, characteristics with the light blocking. And then the third way, if you would like to try using a mylar strip. You would just hold that on the palatal side of the tooth and this helps get a general basic guide on the shelf there. This way is a little more challenging in my mind because it's harder to manage the thickness of the material and also to manage the contours. So, but it still works. Any one of those will work just fine but trying to just freehand the composite on there is probably the most difficult way to do things because that's, that's the hardest to try and get the shape and the thickness of the materials where you need them to be. So today I'm just gonna illustrate this silicone putty index that helps guide the shape and control the thickness. The tooth has already been prepared and the way we did it is I just used a really fine grit diamond and I came across this facial incisal cavo surface margin at about 45 degrees and put a little bevel across here and then I just wrapped that bevel up onto the facial about two to three millimeters and it's an infinity finish line. There's no definable margin here. And then from there, I used air abrasion to sandblast most of the surface of the tooth, not the whole thing, but well beyond where I'm anticipating the composite to be. So probably around in this, this zone here is where you can see it micro etched. Okay, so isolation is key on a restoration like this. We're using the Optrigate lip retractors, keeps things visible. And then we don't wanna bond the two teeth together. So we're gonna use some Teflon tape and we'll just stretch that right over tooth number nine. A good little trick is you can just take the two ends and then twist them. And that helps keep it tight up against the tooth. And then you can just trim off the excess so you don't have a little tail flinging out of the way. 
and that gives us good separation and isolation while we're working. All right, so first step is gonna be our tooth shampoo. We'll get some etch, and just like I did with the air abrasion, I'm gonna go well beyond my anticipated finish line. And this is totally acceptable. It's not doing anything bad to the enamel. And I wanna make sure I'm getting back over onto that lingual incisal finish line. And I just have a butt joint here on the inside. I did not create a chamfer. I just left it how it fractured and I just used the sand blaster to clean the surface. Okay. A little rinse of water. Try and keep that flavor off you here, Mason. All right, and then for the bonding resin, we're gonna to use Tokuyama's Universal Bond. And this stuff is really awesome. It's a wonderful bonding agent. It's a truly universal bonding agent, meaning it can be used on all materials and in all circumstances. One of the features that I like best about it is you don't have to scrub it in for 15 or 20 seconds and you don't have to light cure it. So I've got enough on there and then I'll just air thin it. And we can keep working. And one of the advantages of that type of a bonding resin is when you're working in difficult to reach areas or deep interproximal boxes, it's uh, you don't have to worry about the light not being able to reach the resin to cure it. So. All right, so for this first layer, since Mason has some internal characterization here, I'm gonna do a little more of a advanced technique where I'm gonna use the Omnichroma. There we go. And then I'll just use a traditional composite instrument little blade to adapt it up against that lingual part of the putty. And then I'll bring any excess up towards the incisal and wipe it off. Thickness wise, I'm just trying to get this about a quarter of a millimeter thick. If you're gonna measure it, it's very, very thin. It would be thin enough that it's almost like a little translucent window but it's there to just act as a, as a shaping guide for the rest of the layers. And it helps me have more control over how much blocker I'm gonna actually need to hide some of these translucent parts. So with the challenge with this type of a restoration is trying to hide the finish line or that's the hard edge of the tooth preparation you got this angled fracture and if you just used one layer of any traditional composite or even just one layer of pure omnichroma then you're going to get too much light passing through that and it's going to look like that part of the restoration is gray and you'll see that hard line that hard finish line go ahead jed so we need to try and block out some of that light transmission. And the Omnichroma blocker helps us do that. But we need to make sure we're controlling the thickness of that. Because it is a little bit more opaque, in order to block the light, if we have it too thick, then it's gonna end up with a opaque restoration. You'll see the hard line still, because you're gonna have this opaque restoration against a less opaque rest, uh, tooth structure. So at the point we're at right now, we've got a nice shape to work with. And now we have all the freedom in the world to do the next layers. So now we're gonna use our blocker. And just imagining 
we're trying to reproduce what natural tooth structure is on these layers. So we've got this omnichroma shelf, which is really thin, which is acting like the enamel, which is semi-translucent. And now we're gonna work with the dentin layer, which is more opaque. And as you're layering it here, you'll be able to tell if you've got enough because it's not having this grayish tone on the tooth and you don't want to fill it out facially so thick that it's beyond the the final contours of the tooth because then it's going to be more it's going to be too opaque so as you're layering this i'm keeping an eye on from a lateral view how thick it is or you can use your mill your mirror from the incisal point of view but i am feathering it up onto this bevel that i created just a little bit and that's going to help hide that fracture line in the tooth. And I'm also not going to bring it all the way to the interproximal contact because if you're thinking about how tooth structure is, that part of the tooth is pure enamel as it wraps in between. So I'm going to save that for the, the final omnichroma layer. All right, that's looking pretty good. Let's cure that. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna take off my little Teflon tape so I can now see better the tooth that I'm trying to match. And Mason has he doesn't have any incisal translucency to worry about, but there is a little bit of interproximal translucency right here. So we're gonna try and replicate that here. And he has a little bit of actual, a um, little higher chroma or coloration and density up at the tip here. So we'll use some of the Estelite colored resins to get those effects. There's a little bit of blue for the interproximal and a little bit of chroma for the incisal part. But before I do that, I want to put just a super thin layer of the Omnichroma again. Because the dentin layer, I actually created it or with the block art, the blocker layer. If you saw my instrument, I was creating these little vertical lines in the dentin or the artificial dentin I was creating there. And so the reason I did that is because it helps scatter the light, just like natural tooth scatters the light. If you were to strip away all the enamel on the tooth, you would find that the dentin has little vertical striations in it. And so by reproducing that, we're recreating nature and reflecting the light the same way the tooth does. So this little layer of Omnichroma is not to full contour yet, but it's really just to be a nice smooth layer so that I can add some of these little colored resins and control how those are blending in. And then after we add those effects, the final layer of Omnichroma will be just enough to allow those to show through just a little bit. So when I use the Estelite color resins, we got the blue and then there's a medium chroma. There's also a low chroma and a high chroma. So I'm just gonna put a little dot on my glove here of each of these. And I'll do the blue first. And I wanna be very careful not to overdo it. So we're creating an artificial translucency here, just on this little interproximal area. Very subtle, we don't want it to be too strong. On the camera, on the video part, you probably can't even 
really see that, but it's, it's very subtle. And then we'll do the medium chroma. I can see he's got a little bit, as I'm looking at his tooth number nine, there's some chroma right in here. And so I'm just gonna lightly add some of that. Good. All right. Go for it. Because these colored resins are pretty intense, if you're not careful and you overdo it, then it'll show through too strongly. And you got to keep in mind that as you're working on the teeth like this, the natural enamel is dehydrating a little bit. And so those effects that you're trying to replicate become a little more intense. So you got to remember what it'll look like before you started. And that's where if you have a camera, you can take a picture of the tooth before you start and have that as a reference point. All right, and now we'll do our final Omnichroma layer. All right. And on this final layer, I'm also going to bring it in approximately and close up the the little diastema that's there. And I'm gonna feather it beyond the margin of where I think it's gonna finish up. Where's my little blue shin here? And then I'll use a little mylar strip. It goes right in between. And this is a little trick that uh, I think most people know about. It's called the mylar pole. And so you get the composite started, and then you just drag it down in approximately. Now, the contact's not super tight right now, but because there's no bonding resin on that adjacent tooth, we had it protected with the Teflon tape. We're totally safe to now just let this composite lightly touch. And then we can just use our interproximal strips to break the contact without opening it up. I've got my little super thin, this little interproximal carver instrument is very helpful on these types of restorations where it's ultra, ultra thin. It's just like a flimsy little blade. It's very, very thin. So you can work it in between here very easily. And this tooth is a little bit shorter in the beginning. So we're gonna leave it shorter and not try to build it up. There you go. So for finishing and polishing, this composite, again, is just a wonderful material to work with. When it shines, because of the particle size, the 260 nanometer particle size, and it's spherical, and so that's what gives it its, its uh, structural coloring properties, uh, but it also really polishes nice just because of the way those particles fit together and it holds its shine really nice.
I always start by using a coarse disc to get the initial outline form. Looking good. We'll make sure that this contact is open. There it goes. And we'll use our little IPR strip to make sure that's a nice smooth transition up here at the gingival margin. Sorry, Mason, I know that feels real awesome right there. Okay, now that we've got the basic outline form, we're gonna use uh, some different polishing techniques to get the final surface texture. When you're doing a restoration like this on a front tooth, if you over polish the composite compared to what the natural enamel is, then you'll see a difference. You wanna be able to get that light reflection to be the same as what it's bonded to. And Mason has pretty smooth teeth in general, so there's not a whole lot of texture going on. So I'm just gonna use a carbide finishing burr on a slow speed hand piece so I can really control uh, not gouging the material. And I'm just gonna go across and create some surface texture, make sure that if there's any vertical aspects to um, the anatomy with lobes and grooves, then I can replicate that. And we'll just get to that point. It's also a very safe way to obtain uh, the texture when using it on a slower hand speed or high, a slower spinning hand piece so that you're not ruining the enamel as well. So this just goes right across the natural enamel without doing anything, just kind of bumps right across it, but it's doing what we need to on the composite. And since we went across beyond our finish line, with the etch and the air abrasion as I'm removing that little thin layer of composite. With this, I'm not damaging the enamel, but it's getting the surface texture we need to match up perfectly. So it works really good. So we've just added a little bit of texture to the tooth and we wanna smooth and blend it in now without uh, erasing all of it, but we don't want it to be over texturized. So this little polishing tool, a little rubber polishing disc that's kind of worn down a little bit but it works really good at smoothing and blending without kind of overdoing it. Think of it like a pencil eraser where you're erasing a little bit of the texture. So just be watchful as you're doing it. There we go. So the texture looks really good at this point. It just doesn't have the shine we need. And so when you look at a composite, you want it to have the right kind of a shine. If you overshine it, it's not gonna blend in with the, with the tooth structure, with the enamel. So this polishing brush, it's a silicone impregnated stiff bristled brush. So it gets into the little textures that you create without erasing 
but it also shines the composite and the enamel at the same level, so they really blend seamlessly. Okay. So just through the, the video camera, you can see that we've got enough blocker there that it doesn't let any light show through. The natural enamel has dehydrated a little bit, so we might need to wait a little bit, a couple hours for things to rehydrate and we'll see that um, it just blends in seamlessly. So let's get our final picture here. I don't know if I adjusted the bite on the inside yet, did I? So in the end, what I just did here was kind of a modified version of the polychromatic layering technique where you're gonna use anywhere from three to five or seven shades of composite to get kind of the ultimate aesthetics on a restoration where you have a semi-translucent lingual shelf, your dentin layer, your enamel layers, any modifying colors, and then another semi-translucent layer to go over the top. That creates a natural translucency effect where you don't have to use the colors as much, um, the Estelite color modifiers, but that takes a lot of time. Um, in most practices, if you're using insurance, you're not gonna get reimbursed well for those types of restorations. And so if you're gonna invest a lot of time into those and not get compensated, that's very frustrating. So if you can have a material that blends in perfectly with the tooth every time, then you can keep your overhead costs down with keeping 10 different colors of composites on the dentin shades, the enamel shades, the translucent shades, and you can simplify it down to just two. And on an exceedingly challenging restoration like this to make it look really good with only two composites, I mean, that is just almost unheard of. It's incredible how this material works. So even just now with the tooth dehydrated, you can see just how nice that blends in. And when the tooth rehydrates and it's within the framework of his lips, it's just gonna be perfect. And knowing that he can keep that for a long time if the color of the tooth changes, and I don't have to replace it again in the future because it's not matching in color, I don't know what gets better than that. That's just awesome. So hopefully this has been a helpful tutorial on a little more advanced technique on layering this this composite where you can do it very basically with one shade and get a great result but if you want to get really really good results uh, very predictable results then you use a silicone putty backdrop and you layer it the way we illustrated here and you'll just get amazing results every time <laughs>